So, good morning, good afternoon, good time of day. I'm Kai Arne, the CEO of Maria DB Foundation, and I have the pleasure to do, talk to Felix Schuster, the managing director and co founder of Edgeless Systems in Bochum, Bochum, Germany. Welcome, Felix. Thank you. Hello, Kai. So, so you and your company are new to most participants of our server minifest. So, so to get going, uh, I'll ask you a couple of simple questions about edgeless DB and what is called uh, confidential computing. So on the top level, you're talking about a super secure version of MariaDB server, as I understand it. And last time I looked, it was MariaDB 10.5.11 and running on special hardware uh, that enables so-called enclaves. Is that the, the overall picture? Is that right? That is the overall picture, yes. We, we essentially took MariaDB and ported it to the enclave environment and added a few bells and whistles. So, so, so what is an enclave? I mean, I know that the Vatican City and San Marino are enclaves, <laughs> sovereign states surrounded by Italy, and Lesotho is surrounded by South Africa. Is this something similar? It is something similar. It's a, it's a nice anal analogy. Um, so an enclave is your own space that's encapsulated by a hostile environment. So if you, if you think about Italy as a hostile environment to, to the Vatican, possibly, I don't know, um, then you, you almost get the right picture already. And an enclave, in more technical terms, you can think of it as a, a highly secure mini virtual VM that you can <laughs> create on a possibly untrustworthy system. Okay, so we'll get more into that, uh, into details of that. Um, I'd like first to ask a comparison to other database security approaches and security uh, solutions. I mean, all database uh, offer access control and disk encryption. So I suspect this is something more than that. Exactly. So if you just take a look at what these enclaves provide us. So they are available on, on many recent Intel, Intel CPUs, and they are also available on, uh, on, on cloud providers like Azure or, or Ali Cloud. And I, as a programmer, I can go and I can tell the CPU to create an enclave for me, just like I can tell the CPU to add two numbers for me. Right? Or I can tell it to create a virtual VM, a virtual machine, for example. And, and now this enclave has three inter interesting properties, essentially. And the first one being isolation. And we already spoke a bit about isolation. So you can think of the enclave as being an environment that's, that's strictly isolated from the rest of its, of, of its host. That's the first, the first important feature. And the second important feature, maybe, maybe that's, that's, that's even more exciting, is that everything that resides inside an enclave is always encrypted in, in main memory. So we can, we can say that this enclave gives us runtime encryption for our, our data and our code. That's, that's the, the second important property. And this is what most people are the most excited about when they talk about enclaves. And now there is a third property, and the third property is verifiability. So if I have now running this enclave in, in, in the cloud, um, I can verify that it is indeed a good enclave running on genuine Intel hardware. And I can verify precisely what is running inside there. So I can verify that there is indeed MariaDB in a certain version, a certain configuration running inside that enclave. And then I can create a secure channel and, and set my data over with confidence. Mm -hmm. so, so you said, I mean, I was already mentioning encryption, but that was disk encryption. You're yes. not saying that it's encrypted also in, in memory. Yes, correct. Yeah, and you, and you mentioned the two basic security measures that that databases normally apply, which are access control and disk encryption. And these are great, right? And they are, they are necessary, um, but enclaves, they 
they can enforce these measures. Mm -hmm. right? So if you, if you think about a malicious administrator, for example, right? you're, you're running your, your MariahDB on, on a system that's not fully trustworthy, maybe you don't trust the administrator, then normal access control and disk encryption only protect you partially from the administrator because he or she, they are able to, to bypass these mechanisms, right? They can maybe just directly read from your, from your process, from, from, from your, your database's main memory, or they can rearrange data on disk while the database is running and do many, many complicated things in order to either corrupt your data or get access to your data. And if you're not running your database inside an enclave, and you take some additional measures, you can protect against threats like a malicious administrator. So, so you really trust nobody. Um, uh, so what, what, uh, what is a, a use case for that? I mean, what's a scenario where you, uh, with the, the customer of your, of your databases, realize that you cannot trust their their admins, what are basically the use cases for a confidential database like HSDB? Yeah, so there are, there are two primary use cases. First one is additional security. And I think we, we already painted a picture there, right? You, if, you, if you use HSDB, which is variety running inside an enclave, you get additional security properties. This is the, the first use case take your database security to the next level. The other use case is that you can use these nice new properties to build new applications that possibly weren't possible before. And I would be an example of that. Of course. So think about, um, we now have this enclave and it's running a database. And we can verify this enclave and we know that no one can look inside it. No one can manipulate it. So we can use it as a trusted third party to, to pool or share data. Think, for example, about banks wanting to, to pool customer data to identify fraud. Right? Maybe they, they have two customer databases and they want to cross-check which of these customers maybe is uh, well, which of these customers are common between them and who of them are maybe doing dubious transfers. Now, in, 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 the, in the existing world, they would have the problem that they would need a trusted third party, some custodian to help them with cross-checking the data because typically they wouldn't want to reveal the data to each other. And now if you have a, a confidential database, you can use that as a, as a trusted third party, like, like as a neutral middle ground. And you can, you can set it up, maybe in the cloud, you can, both parties can verify that there is a database that has precisely the properties that they wanted to have. And then they can send over their data and they can make sure that only certain queries are run on that data and that only certain parties get access to the results. That, that makes is sense to me. So, so then um, going on on this technical side of it, um, that, that, uh, I mean, I see the uh, benefit of it. I see, see what the use case is, uh, but I'm sure it also means uh, additional computing. So how many percent, if you will, is the performance penalty for, for all of that? Yeah. So in the past, Enclaves could be rather expensive, um, but the latest generation of Intel CPUs, um, the third generation Xeons, the Ice Lake line of CPUs, they have some, some great performance improvements. And in some benchmarks, the overhead can be very small. Um, in, but on average, it is it is in the like 30%. This is, this is like, like, like ballpark what you will get in a, in a 
complex benchmark like TPCC. You will never become a politician because you gave an exact answer to the question I asked. 30%. That's <laughs> yeah. So, of course, I mean, you, you, know, you know this uh, probably better than I do uh, or possibly better than I do. Benchmarks, it always depends on, this, on, on, on the setting and it depends on the precise parameters. Right. But on average, what, what, what we are seeing is like TPC seen in, in, in different configurations could be like... 30% give or take. Yeah, of course, number. that's not, not an exact number, but it, it gives you the order of magnitude. It's yeah. not like a, a 2x and it's not 1%. So 30% yeah, is, exactly. is, is a good figure to, to understand. So, so then, uh, so that was one of my technical questions. Another one is how difficult is it to use? I mean, uh, the setup, the installation and setup, is that the only difficulty? Or does it also require changes in the application architecture? The, the new use case you said, uh, where, where instead of having a third party uh, that, that you uh, entrust, that of course, that is, that is a different architecture, but that's probably a simpler architecture than having a third party. But, but if you just wish to, uh, to use an enclave, is the difficulty in the installation and setup or also in the application architecture? Yeah, so the, the, the quick answer is there's not much difficulty. We try to make this as, as seamless as possible. And if you want to run edgeless DB, it, you, you, you need to do two things, essentially. You need to have an enclave-enabled CPU, like a recent Intel Xeon with Intel SGX capabilities. And then you need to run our Docker image. That is what you need to do. And this can be like, like, like super easy. If you, if you have a corresponding CPU, maybe on-prem or maybe in the cloud, maybe in Azure, then you may be just good to go. And you can type in Docker run and then well, the image and some, some, some parameters. And then you have your confidential database. That is pretty, pretty straightforward and pretty simple. Um, if you like it even simpler, you can, you can even go to the Azure Marketplace and there is a free offering where you can, with a few clicks, get a out-of-the-box HSDB running in, in, in the cloud. So that's, that's super simple. I looked up SGX, which is what you've been mentioning here, is Software Guard Extensions. So is that something that uh, most new Xeons have, or is it is the special edition of Xeon? And also, uh, is uh, this uh, enclaves concept something that, that is Intel specific? Yes. So um, let's unfold this. We, if you have a recent Intel server CPU, um, chances are rather high that you you have. SGX capabilities. And you, if you go to intel.com and you type in your, your CP, CPU serial number, you, you will be able to check if you have SGX capabilities. Or maybe you can just check in your operating system. Um, in the past, Intel used to also used to add this to, to client CPUs. Like a couple of the older Core i7, Core i5 CPUs have it. And you can also run HSDB on that, but it's really made for the for the server CPUs, because that makes the most sense. And, and also they are, they are quite a bit faster. Mm -hmm. um, if you're running the cloud, you, you need to make sure that you have, that, that you run, you're running on a, on, on a VM that ha explicitly has support for, for SGX. So if you, if you go to Azure or to Ali Cloud, uh, you need to make sure to, to select a, a VM size that explicitly, explicitly has support for SGX. Mm -hmm. yeah. And what about non-Intel things? Right. Um, so AMD has, has similar capabilities, but it works a bit differently there. So for now, HSDB only runs on, on the Intel version of, of secure enclaves. Okay. So, so let me now go to the topic of, of uh, integration between HSDB and, and MariaDB. So, uh, why did you, why and how did you choose MariaDB? Yes. So what we, 
we started with the idea of, of, of building a confidential database. And we initially, we, we weren't even database experts and we didn't quite know what to pick. I mean, the, the market is huge and confusing, right? Um, but what we, what we figured after many discussions with potential partners and customers is that SQL is still a very important feature, even in a, in a world where, where there is no SQL and, and so forth. And also, MySQL and MariaDB are two very well-known standards, right? And um, people know what MariaDB is, people know what MySQL is. And uh, oftentimes, if you have something that is compatible with these, you can just plug, plug into an existing interface at, at your customer and they can, they can just proceed as normal. Um, and that's, that's great. This is why we pick MariaDB. Um, and on the other hand, of course, MariaDB being open source and having a, an active community also is what was great, great for us and played, played a great role in our decision because we really needed to, to have something that is well built and open source, battle proven. And that led us to MariaDB. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, another technical basis uh, that, that you're building upon is, is my rocks. And that is a bit of a surprise. I mean, if you go with what people know and what people use, that would be InnoDB, but uh, you're basing it on, on my rocks. And how come? Yes. So the, the current version of HSDB is, is indeed based on my rocks. Um, go, we, we know that my rocks has some limitations. For example, it, it still does not support foreign keys, which is probably the biggest the biggest limitation. Um, so, so going forward, we, we really would love to support InnoDB as well. The, the reason why we picked MyRox is that it has an interesting internal architecture called uh, SST tables. And these SST tables, they can be encrypted in a very nice and efficient way. In a, well, and also in a way that is fit for the threat model that we are considering with Edgeless DB. So in a nutshell, without going too much into detail, um, MyRox only produces read-only files. It never, it, it never modifies data files on disk. And that allows us to very efficiently encrypt these files and integrity protect these files. And we, we don't need to, to use fancy data structures like Merkle trees. Um, we, we, we can sidestep that and still get very good security properties that you normally don't get. Um, and we like the, the property that we get is we essentially get integrity for your entire database state at any given time. So not only integrity for a single file or, or, or table, in a, in, a, in a database, we, we get integrity for the entire snapshot. And mm -hmm. this is important in an enclave threat model because we don't trust the administrator, we don't trust the host operating system. So we need to make sure that everything is always protected against these very strong attackers that we consider. And that was the, the reason for us to choose MyRox. Um, and we're looking forward to, to porting these properties to, to InnoDB. Mm -hmm. Good. So um, you've been mentioning Azure and, and Ali Cloud. Mm -hmm. uh, what about other clouds? Mm -hmm. Yes. So GCP and AWS, they don't have the capabilities that we require. So they don't enable SGX in, 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 in their VMs. And this may change in the future. Hopefully it will. Um, and there are a couple of smaller cloud vendors that, that enable SGX. So if we, if we look at the European cloud landscape, maybe most notably OVH has support for SGX. So you can run HSDB on OVH if you, if you want to. Okay, yeah. good, good. So, uh, and then uh, another technology question. So you're basing uh, your HSDB, of course, on your own technology and on MariaDB. Uh, what about uh, front ends and other uh, free and open source technology that, that you work with? Is, is, are there any other um, components to it? Yes. So 
first of all, everything is open source. Um, and this is very important. I mean, open source has value in itself, right? Or it, it, it has different, there are, different re there, 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 there are different reasons to open source software, but especially in the confidential computing and enclave context, it's, it's even more important because as I said earlier, one important aspect of confidential computing is that you can verify precisely what is, what is running inside your enclave. And if you don't have open source running inside your enclave, then it's difficult to really make a good assessment of the contents and the functionality of your enclave. So that's a very strong point for, for open source in, in this setting. Um, and yeah, we already discussed MariaDB, of course, we discussed MyRox. And there are a couple of other open source components that we, 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 we stitched together to build Edgeless DB. There, we are using a framework called Open Enclave. So this is sort of the, the standard for the basic framework for building Enclave software. It originally came out of Microsoft, but it's now, it has been donated and it's being maintained by the Linux Foundation. So we, so we build on top of that and we have our own compatibility layer on top of that, that emulates certain system calls that MariaDB requires that are not present in Open Enclave. And next to that, we have a, a front end that we've written in Go that's also running inside the Enclave. And this front end adds advanced Enclave specific features that normally don't come with MariaDB. And it exposes an easy to use REST API. And essentially that REST API allows you to do three things. It allows you to verify the integrity and the identity of the, of the Enclave using, using, using a simple web request. Um, that's one thing. The other thing is it allows you to recover the database in case of failure, because one important feature of enclaves is that they can securely store state in between, in between restarts, and we, we make that easy to use. And the, the last important feature is that you can use this front end to set what we call a manifest. And this manifest. And now you talk about this uh, manifest. So, what is this manifest feature about? I, I hear it's a JSON file, and I've heard it being compared to a smart contract, but I don't know what the smart contract is. So, can you expand a bit about this concept of manifest? Yes, yes, yes. yes. I think it's a very interesting concept, and uh, the comparison with a smart contract, I think it helps. So, smart contract, as you may know, comes from the blockchain world. It is a, a contract that's written in code, right? Um, something that the different parties agree on. And in our case, this manifest, it defines the, it's a JSON file, a simple JSON file that defines the initial state of the database. So you can, you can define a set of tables, you can define a set of users, and you can define certificate authorities that are used to identify those users. But can, cannot uh, an evil sysadmin go and tweak that JSON file to his heart's or her heart's content? That, that is a very good question. And, 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 and normally, yes. But since we're using confidential computing and we use some, 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 some cool tricks here, what, what happens is, once you, you set the money, you can only set the manifest once initially, right? You start up the, the database, it is in an uninitialized state, and then you can upload your manifest. And once you've uploaded it, it becomes part of the enclave attestation statement that you verify. So if you go and verify, uh, Actually, be instance running somewhere, you learn A, that it's running on secure hardware inside a secure enclave. You learn the precise version of the software that's running there. And three, or, or, or C, you learn that 
there is a certain manifest and, and, and you learn the contents of that manifest. And you can, based on that information, you can decide if you can trust the database or not. And if there was malicious admin and they just put a wrong manifest there, it would be evident immediately. Right, so, so uh, you probably can get some extra benefits or features out of this, this manifest. Have you, do you have any examples for how to practically use manifests? Yes, so that ties back to the use cases that we spoke about earlier. Um, the new apps that become possible. And um, I spoke about this example of the two banks wanting to, to, to cross compare or, or pool customer data. And in that case, you would use the manifest to define who is able to do what in the database and also define the identities of these parties. So before, before sending the data, the banks could verify the manifest and all the other things. And then they would know precisely what this database can do and what it, what it cannot do. Mm -hmm. um, so I think we're ending, uh, getting closer to the allocated time here. I still have two questions for you. So uh, if one wants to try it out, how can one do it? I mean, you were mentioning uh, going on, on Azure and, 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 and testing there. Is that the best way to try out and kick the tires of HLSDB? Yeah, possibly the easiest way is to, to go to, to Azure, to the Azure Marketplace and, and search for HSDB um, or go to GitHub and search for HSDB. And there we have a couple of, of Docker images and you can just pull the Docker image if you have the corresponding hardware at your disposal. Mm -hmm. yep. And uh, so before my concluding question, I, I'd like to ask you, what did I forget to ask you what would you have wished that i would uh, that that i would ask you to get the more for the uh, audience to get the more complete picture of, of hsdb um i think we we, we touched on, on on all of the important aspects um yeah we spoke about the foundations confidential computing and the secure enclaves we spoke about the use cases being additional security and new exciting applications where you want to share and pool data in a secure way. Uh, we spoke about the manifest. We spoke about briefly about the open source architecture. I, I think we've covered it all. Um, yeah. So then I have a concluding question for you. Why did you call it Edgeless DB? <laughs> yeah. Um, because our company is called Edgeless Systems and it kind of made it kind of made sense. And maybe now the next question is why did we call the company Edgeless Systems? And the answer here is, it kind of sounds cool, um, at least to German ears. I'm not sure if, if, if that's true internationally, um, but it, it means end-to-end -end secure without a gap, without an edge between. It's just from here to there, everything is always encrypted all the time. That that's makes sense to my semi-German, semi-Finnish here. So <laughs> those are good, good uh, concluding words. Thank you, Felix Schuster. Very, very interesting presentation. Yes, yeah, thank you for having me. Um, looking